We've gone on a good journey the last little bit as we've done this sermon series on conflict. We're getting close to the end of that journey. Last week we started, for some people, finally, to get to what do you do when you have a problem with someone. And we're going to do that, uh, talk about that a little bit more this week and next week as well. And we used a very specific model last time we called pause, which was plan out what you're going to say when you're going to confront somebody, affirm the relationship, understand their interests, search for creative solutions, and finally evaluate objectively and rationally how you can overcome the problems. Imagine someone's not feeling well. Something's clearly not going right in their body, and they, they go and make an appointment with the doctor to try to figure out what's wrong, and uh, they sit down and the doctor says to them, we're going to run a gamut of tests. I'm going to narrow it down. We're, we're going to run tests to determine whether you have a hundred different diseases. A hundred. Might sound like overkill, but sometimes overkill is okay, right? Something like that, and uh, make an appointment for going back, and you go back a few days later, and the doctor says, "Well, we've run, we've run this gamut of tests, a hundred different diseases, and I've got good news. You did extremely well. In fact, I'm going to score you 99 percent. You don't have 99 percent of the diseases we tested for." You kind of stop. Well, I want to hear about this one that I do have. What, what, what is wrong? Well, the one you have, it's, it's a really aggressive form of uh, cancer. Why? Hang on. But th that sounds kind of serious. No, no. You scored 99%. Don't you remember back when you were at school? 99% sounds pretty good. Go home. Enjoy the fact that you scored 99%. That wouldn't make any sense, would it? No, not at all. 99% sometimes is not quite good enough. 99% sounds impressive, but it's amazing the damage that 1% can do. Jesus, when he is uh, just about ready to go to the cross, he prays and says, I do not ask for these only, he's talking about his disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, which is all of us, that they may be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And say in that, the 100% of the time we always have to get along, but it does make it clear that if there are things that are going wrong in the world around us, one of the big problems actually comes back to the church. That there is a lack of love, unity, and forgiveness among those who claim to believe in Jesus Christ. And it's easy to blame the world for all the problems that exist in this day and age. Oh, it's all the government's fault, or it's all secularism, or, you know, some, and certain times that's true. But the Bible also makes it clear that the church has to stand up and take responsibility and to understand the challenges that exist when we don't live the way that we think we should. We, we might look around and say, well, we're, we're better than most of the world out there or something like that. And you know what? That's not always good enough. We can applaud ourselves for being pretty good. But where anger or unforgiveness rules, that is kind of like that cancer that very quickly can destroy the rest. I said uh, that I'm just, for illustrations and stories through this sermon series, I'm just stealing everything because it's way too personal. And um, 
want to read a little bit of a story that I, I ran across. And I do just have to emphasize, because every once in a while I steal stories, and the names in the stories always get changed. You know how that is? But sometimes they get changed to people who are in this room. So um, and that happened with the story that I told last week, and it's going to happen again today. So it's not. Yeah. I'm saying that because poor Larry over there, it's going to involve him. So it's not. It doesn't. It's just his name that gets stolen. Janet waited patiently for all of Larry's students to go through the door. And when she saw that they had all gone out, she very carefully walked in as he was putting his papers back into his briefcase. She walked up to him and said, Do you, do you, have, do you have a couple minutes? Uh, he kind of looked wary because he figured he knew what was coming. Well, I'm pretty busy right now. What do you want to talk about? Well, I'd like to ask you forgiveness for the way that I spoke to you last week and talk about how we're relating to each other. But if this isn't a convenient time, I, I can come back later. Surprised to hear that the first words coming out were about forgiveness. He said, no, no, it's, it's okay. I, I can take a couple minutes. Well, thanks. Well, like I said, I need to ask your forgiveness for what I said in the teacher's lounge last week. When you joked about me in front of Steve and Joyce, I lost my temper. And I lashed out at you. I was wrong. And I'm sure I embarrassed you. Would you please forgive me? off guard a little bit by the transparency there. And all I could say was, ah, it's okay. I know at times I can be a little brazen. Just forget about it. Janet has spent time figuring out different ways in which she might respond. She talked it out with, with a counselor friend who was, who was able to kind of give her some good ideas of what might come. And she had the perfect response, and I think it's a good response. It's going to actually play into our sermon next week. Forgetting can take a long time. I'd appreciate it if you would say that you forgive me. Sure, whatever, I forgive you. Let's just drop it. So in response to that, since I blew up at you in front of Steve and Joyce, I want you to know that I plan to go to them and admit that I was wrong as well. Is there anything I can do to make this right with you? Anything that I've done to offend you? I responded, not that I can think of. Well, maybe you can help me understand something. If I've done anything else to offend you, if I haven't done anything else to offend you, sorry, why do you say sarcastic things about me in front of others? Oh, I'm just kidding around. Can't you take a joke? Maybe you don't mean to hurt me, but it doesn't feel like a joke, Larry. It's embarrassing to be made fun of front of the people I work with every day. And I'm not sure they think it's funny either. And I don't think I'm the only person who's staying clear in the teacher's lab just to avoid your jokes. Oh, so now I'm the big bad wolf, he responded sarcastically. And all the piggies need to run home. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I mean. <laughs> you seem to have a habit of calling people names and tearing them down. It's not a good example for our students, and I'm, I'm sorry to say that I don't think it's a good example of your faith. What do you mean? Sometimes I think that you're acting like a hypocrite. They can't, people around can't understand how you can claim to be a Christian, yet speak so critically all the time. Larry cringed to Janet's words, and he began to find a way to end the conversation that was quickly becoming quite uncomfortable for him. I don't think you mean to do it, she said. I believe you want to have a positive witness, but it seems you're stuck in the habit of saying hurtful things to people. I've struggled with the same problem, Larry. I've hurt so many people with my words. Just ask my family. But God is so forgiving. He doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. He wants to free us from hurtful habits. He doesn't want you and me fighting with each other. 
He'd be so pleased if we forgave each other and worked together to improve our relationship and therefore our witness around him. Larry had never been approached like this in his entire life. The truth in Janet's words stung, but her tone of voice and a reminder of God's forgiveness held out the glimmer of hope. He slumped in the chair, sighed in weariness and regret. I'm going to stop the story there. When we have a problem with a person, God has a plan for us. I read a little bit from Matthew 18 earlier that said in part, and again, I'm reading a bit of a different translation than earlier. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to him, you gain a brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you. That every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be as a Gentile and a tax collector. We come back to where we were last week. And I asked a question. If you weren't here last week, you can find the sermon on YouTube, on our website. The, the key thing is, I asked a question. How hurt do you have to be? How mad do you have to be to make it acceptable to break the commands of God? We can justify ourselves in our own eyes. And I got to tell you, as I have been around churches and talked to, to pastors and church people, not just from our own church, but from churches all around, I have heard stories where conflict has been handled very and I've heard some stories where it has been handled very poorly. And I've seen people who are so upset with either leadership in the church or with others in the church that maybe their response is they go around and they talk to everybody about what's going on. And that becomes a response to go around and to gossip. Or, or, they do it in such a way that they let the anger just build up inside of them until it gets to the point they just have a big public blow up. There are moments of time in church life and family life and community life where we just need to ignore things, get over them. But there are times where we cannot do that. Not that we want to be busybodies interfering in people's lives. That's why we talked about first about repentance, about looking the hog that's in our own eyes, as Jesus says. We need to always make sure that our motives are right, to keep pride in check, which is very hard. To not just have somebody all figured out and go along some premeditated script saying, I got you all figured out. But to do what the example in our story was, start by listening. We need to look out for other people's needs and interests. We need to make sure that somebody else's failures don't make us feel good because there are moments of time where it is pleasant to our ego that somebody else is doing wrong. That's the cause. That's happening. We know the cause is in our heart. When do these verses actually apply? When do we know that we need to go and talk to somebody? I'll give you a list. We talk to somebody and we know that their actions are dishonoring to God. Their sin is flagrant. It's obvious. If they are believers in Jesus, that their Christian witness is damaged. Secondly, that it is damaging your relationship with them to the point that their actions, their feelings, their words are doing things that you cannot just ignore and let go of and continue to have a relationship in any way. Is it hurting somebody else? Certainly if it's putting somebody else in danger, there's an abusive situation or something, then we've really got to get involved. But sometimes it's a little more subtle. They can see their actions are doing damage to another person. 
And finally, is it hurting them? Sometimes we don't even realize how much our actions can damage our own reputation, our own selves. Those are the cases where we step out and we go to somebody and we say there's something going wrong here. And that's when we step into these verses. There are times where situations may look a little bit differently. We talked about pause last week. There are times where we're in the midst of a situation, it's right in front of us, and we just have to get out of it until we can deal with it with emotions of calm. When things are a little cooler. Notice in my story that I told, Janet waited over a week. She got counsel first. She went and talked to somebody who had nothing to do with the situation. Not in the sense of gossip, but saying, can we, can we run through some scenarios? Can we talk this through? Can you help me? I have lots of people over time who've come to me and said, I just don't know how to handle that situation. And we talk it through, and sometimes you get insight, and then you can go deal with it. But the Bible does talk about the fact that eventually, we need to deal with that. I did a list of verses here. I want you to listen to a few of these. This is one of dozen, or just a few dozens of verses in the Bible I found. Do not hate your brother in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so you will not share his guilt. This is Leviticus 19.17. Listen to this from Proverbs 24.11-12. Rescue those who are being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, does not he weigh the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay each person according to what he has done? Look at this out of Proverbs 27. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. In other words, just acts nice and ignores what's going on. Galatians 6. Brothers, if someone's caught in a sin, your spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you may also be tempted. Or about James? My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover up a multitude of sins. That's just a small sample. We're called to do this. To bring people back. With one goal, to bring glory to God. How do we do that? By restoring relationships. Conflict leading to restoration is a great thing. So our, the verse, once on screen and the screen that went before this, made it very clear. If someone sins against you, if someone is sinning in a way that is bothering you, you go talk to them alone. Now there are, again, there are times where you might make exceptions. Go talk to somebody first to get your, your, your ducks in a row and all that type of stuff. But I said last week that I was having trouble finding that verse in the Bible that says you go put it on Facebook first, right? We don't gossip first. We go and we deal with an individual. And sometimes, you know what? It's exactly what Jesus says here. There are times where they're going to say no. This is particularly difficult, by the way, in family situations. Is it true still in families? I ask a question. What, what, when are we allowed to break the rules of God? I think this is going to be true. Now, it gets a lot more complicated, particularly as husband and wife, when we get to the last step, last couple of steps. But it starts with going, just doing this pause, going to talk. If it's not resolved, then you bring a couple of people. You're not ganging up on somebody, but a couple of close friends. Again, if it's marriage, I don't recommend just bringing all one gender or something. Usually, actually, if it's a marriage, Best talk to me, actually. It's not resolved. Don't gang up on them, but find some leaders. Somebody who everybody respects and talk it out. And if it's not resolved there, you, you bring it to the church, which does not mean 
get up on Sunday morning and somebody else's sins. Does not mean that in any way, stretch, or form. Please do not do that. Um, get up. That's how yeah, churches get in trouble. But anyways, you come to the church leadership and you talk and you deal with it. And then the church needs to decide, the church leadership needs to decide if it's worth pursuing. And at this stage, you might become less involved. And finally, the church may decide to treat them as outsiders. Sometimes it's healthiest to leave the people to God. Sometimes forgiveness is a very difficult topic and there are a lot of subtleties to it that we're going to get next week. But sometimes forgiveness is just stepping away from an individual for a period of time. There are times where even you might have to recognize somebody is dangerous and leave them to God. And sometimes forgiveness is just leaving someone in God's hands. Within this, we remember always that we never confront until we've made it a matter of prayer. And within that prayer time, spending time thanking God for the other person, praising God for his love for that person, and then spending part of my time saying, I release my agenda to you, God. I release my feelings to you because I've even heard people who pray and they come to me later and said, I prayed about this and God told me this and I listened to it and say, I don't think God, would, this, this goes against the scriptures, but sometimes we can manipulate our own feelings and think that we've heard from God but we always have to compare it to what the Bible says. So we have to release our agenda to him. We have to remember that we all make mistakes. If I'm hurt by somebody's comments, if I'm hurt by somebody else, I have to remember that I've done it to somebody else, so maybe you've got to cut them a little slack. And then I always remember that I have been forgiven. I've been forgiven. Do you know the story right after this is one in which a servant goes to a great king and says, can you forgive me or release me from my debts because I can't pay them back to you? And the king says yes. And then the servant goes out and finds a fellow servant and says, you owe me a couple of bucks. And he says, well, I don't have it. Can you forgive me? And he says, no. And when the king hears that the guy he'd forgiven won't forgive the other guy as hasn't thrown in jail. The, the point of the story is forgiveness is absolutely essential, and we're going to get into that a lot next week. And the only way we can forgive somebody is by continually remembering that I have been forgiven myself. How hurt do you have to be to ignore this scripture? question. Last week I said that the process is more important than success. That us being obedient is more important than anything else. And even if we look at it and say there's no way it succeeds, that doesn't release us from obedience because obedience is more important than success. I want to bring us to a slightly different thought though. It's one that I find in the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. It says this, I say the wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. The words of the wise, heard in quiet, are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. <coughs> wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. There's some translations that put that first line, and I like the way this is stated. Wisdom is better than strength. The story of the Bible of David. He's a younger man. He's fleeing from the king. He's on the run. And uh, as he's on the run and hiding in the wilderness, he's helping to look after the local farmers, making sure that there's no animals getting into the livestock, making sure that thieves aren't getting around, kind of providing a little bit of law of order. There's a man in the vicinity that he's, he's helping look after. His name is Nabal. He says, do you know what? I'm helping you 
would you mind sending us a little bit of food? We're starting to run low on, 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 on what we've got. The guy says, absolutely not. David is enraged. He is ready to go down and kill the guy. Nabal's wife, lady by name of Abigail, hears about it, knows David's about to do a serious wrong. And he runs, she races out. I want to read part of what she says to David. On me alone, my Lord, be the guilt. Please let your servants speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant. Let not my Lord regard this worthless fellow Nabal. But I, your servant, did not see the young man, my Lord, whom he said, Now that my Lord is the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, because the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt, and from saving with your own hand, now let your enemies and those who seek you do evil to my Lord, as Nabal. Now let this present, this food that she's bringing, that your servant has brought to my Lord, be given to the young men who follow you. Please forgive the trespasses of your servant, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure help. And she goes on from that, and actually goes on from many more verses, where she gets down, instead of saying, do you know what? There is a bad guy coming. We better get the swords out. We better call all the neighbors together and form a strong power party. She goes and throws herself at his mercy and says, do you know what? We made a mistake. Can we find a way to keep you from committing this sin? And she takes the onus on herself. She realizes wisdom wins the day. We tend to show strength in two ways that are wrong. The first is an over-the-top, angry outpouring of emotions, because sometimes if you're in a situation, it seems that the angriest person can win. And when that happens, everybody loses. Where we use an overwhelming force of emotion which in the end is detrimental not just to the person we're yelling at, but to, the, to us as well. There's a second way in which we can use an overwhelming amount of strength. One that I've, I've seen done wrong. I'm going to ask you an interesting question that I don't have the full answer for. Does this include when politicians do wrong? Do, do, we, do we owe it to them to first, you know, I mean, obviously, if it's somebody in high power, we can't go talk to them, but maybe to inform them, first of all, that they're doing something wrong, and, and then go on from there, and then gather a couple people and send a letter, you know. Do, do we follow the same way? I think probably. It may look a little different. But one way in which I've seen us do it wrong sometimes is we're mad at an issue. And we tend to pile on a thousand other issues. And we throw them a thousand issues at once. And do you know what? If you get a, all the, it becomes a character issue then, right? Because it's not just I made a mistake, it's I'm making thousands of mistakes. So it becomes a character issue. We throw them thousands of mistakes, they just write us off and say, oh, this is just somebody we'll never convince, they're just part of the opposition. I've also seen it done in families. Where all of a sudden, instead, you're, you're mad at your, your spouse, your kids, or whoever, for, for, for an issue. And all of a sudden, instead of it becoming this issue that I'm trying to address, I, I bring in thousands of things from the past. Maybe not thousands, but you know what I mean. We try to overwhelm the situation. You know what? All that does is put the spotlight on sin. It never convinces somebody. And your purpose in both of those cases where you're trying to use strength becomes destruction, not restoration. And the goal is always restoration to bring glory to God. The Bible brings up a lot of different ways in which this might look, and it gives dozens of examples. Ways in which we can keep it from being like that, where kindness rules. From Esther, the queen, trying to confront the king, but first she makes him a nice supper. 
or Jesus confronting a Samaritan woman by the well of her sins, but first of all, confirms her as a person and finds common connection points. There's the Apostle Paul, he confronts the city of Athens for the amount of gods they worship, and first of all says, but I do commend you the fact you're searching. Let me tell you about this God. There's a prophet by the name of Nathan who later in David's life has to confront him for sin, but first of all, points out how David would consider his actions wrong when somebody else had done it. You know what? God wants you to grow. But he wants you to grow in the right way. And sometimes he throws difficult situations in our path to bring to light sin, both in ourselves and others. And he confronts us and says, do it my way. And sometimes we just have to test him. Do it his way. Step out in faith. And feels a little safer just to go tell everybody else. Or it feels a little safer just to ignore this for a while and let it build up. Or it feels safer to handle this in a different way. And God says, test me, try me. Try my way. Try my way. Maybe it's not going to work in this situation, but maybe you're going to grow through it. Maybe you're going to learn. Maybe you're going to become more like me. We test him and let his light shine through us. I want to think about that as we sing the closing hymn. Jesus says he's the light of the world. He says he's the light of the world.